Okay, this is part two of two workshops on generative AI. Part one is mainly around the sort of theory and what it is and what it isn't. You should definitely watch part one first, even though probably most people won't. Um, and it's because it's really important to know how this stuff works to not make mistakes. There's some basics on how these things are trained, what they are good at and what they're not good at will really help you um, make a lot of mistakes or not make a lot of mistakes in the future. So this is AI tools, number of companies making AI tools just over a year ago. And this is the number of companies today. Actually, this is not, this is not AI tools at all. This is SaaS companies from like 2014 to 17, but it's exactly the same thing. So there were no companies around 18 months ago really doing this. Maybe there were five. And today there are thousands. Everyone's got the latest AI tool built on the latest model. Everything's revolutionary. Most of them are very good. Um, it's really difficult to know where to start with these tools and what you should be doing and what you shouldn't be doing. So that's the point of this workshop is to just kind of break it down. And it's good news. You don't need 99% of these tools. So where to start? I'm going to cover today, uh, first of all, written content, kind of basic written content. Then I'm going to go a little section on business planning and marketing. Then I'm going to go through communications and chatbots. Then we're going to go to multimodal, which is images, audio, video, and then some other tools, um, some for the travel industry, some more general. So prompts. Prompts, if you watch the first part, you remember prompts are how you speak to the large language model or the LLM or the AI, the generative AI. So this is really important that you learn how to prompt. This is like speaking. The first thing I tell people is it's like speaking to an assistant or an intern that you've just hired to the company. Um, so you need to explain what you're trying to do. You need to explain the input, you need to explain the output, you need just to be really clear and you're going to talk to the system in the same way you would talk to a person, more or less. A lot of times people will ask me something like, how would I write a prompt to create a marketing campaign, trying to, tar marketing campaign, trying to target German travelers coming to San Francisco in August um, with a medium income <clears throat> and families of four, something like that. They give me this whole long description. And my response is you just type that into a prompt. So usually the best way to start is just to start. Whatever you're trying to get, just think about it, write it down, put it in a prompt and send and see what you get. But here's some basics. So speak to it like it's your assistant. First day, they just showed up for work. You're trying to write a blog post based on traveling to San Francisco over Easter holidays, etc explain exactly what you want, like you would tell a human. So be really clear and specific. You don't need the fluff. You don't need to be particularly nice, although good tone actually helps, funnily enough. Um, there is There are some examples of, by using the word please in a prompt, which sounds weird, but it's true, you get better responses. And potentially the, the concept behind that is when you use the word please, it sees a tone in your language and it reflects that tone when it comes back. That part kind of makes sense. Anyway, I wouldn't bother saying please, but use a nice tone. Provide context, use examples. This is probably the most important thing. So say you're trying to create a list of restaurants to visit in New York City and you want the, the name of the restaurant and you want number of stars and you want average review score and a, and a blurb. So the best way to get that kind of structure is say create a list of 10 restaurants in, in in New York, blah, blah, blah. I want these four sections and then give it four or five exactly formatted examples like you just, like, you, like I just went through that. And it will learn to follow those examples. So examples are really good when you're trying to get a certain structure. Maybe you're trying to get a, a heading followed by one sentence followed by three bullets. That's a simple example. You could probably get away with that pretty easily, but things like that, you want it to follow a certain tone. We use this for responding to reviews. So we've got a review responder at Magpie. And we basically train that. It's not really training, but it's fine tuning that. And we give it examples. So we ask the customer, the operator, to give us 10 good examples of good responses to bad reviews. And they take 10 previous bad reviews. 
they create really good responses to those. And then we save those. And next time they get a bad review, we read that bad review. We create examples of a good response to that bad review. So it takes on their tone, takes on the kind of language they use if they offer refunds or, or call us or please never visit again. Whatever they want to say, it takes up that tone and it follows the examples. Specify the format. You can do lots of formats in generative AI. You can create uh, CSVs. You can create tables. You can create JSON formats. You can create list of bullets, long paragraphs, anything you want. Specify exactly what you want. Some formats are harder than others, but be clear on the basics. Do you want a list of bullets or do you want long form paragraphs? Be concise. Like I say, there's no need for fluff. It's probably not going to hurt you that much, but the more outside fluff that you give it, the more likely it is to get confused. So you don't need to be nice and do a build up and work up some rapport with the thing. Just tell it exactly what you want. And then go back and forth and, and tune that a little bit further if you need to. One question at a time. Um, I always say to people, a good example of this is when you go into, say, a marketing meeting, which is going to be an hour, you might have 10 things you're going to cover. You don't reel off 10 questions at the start and just say, go. Right? You do one question, how are we going to deal with our Instagram account? And then you get lots of ideas. You go back and forth, deal with that. Okay, next thing, what are we going to do about this publication? That kind of thing. So one question at a time, have it focus on one thing at a time. Um, you can always drill down within that, or you can, you can always go off at an angle once you've got the response to the first one, if that's what you need. It's easy to copy and paste prompts back to it. Level of detail, again, is important. It's a bit like the, um, the specify the format. Tell it exactly how much you want. Do you want a couple of words? Do you want a paragraph? Do you want an essay? Be explicit. Don't be afraid to sort of really ask it for the for the level of for the sort of level of level of, level of detail and, and exactly what you want. I think when we speak to humans, we're always a little bit sort of we don't want to make too many demands, or some of us don't. And because we don't want to sort of shock the humans, these things aren't going to be shocked. So you can tell it, explain your work, give me 10 examples, explain why you would do that. You can really be explicit in exactly what you want. So you want to drill down and get to the absolute details the best you can. And then try again. Rarely you're going to get exactly what you want on the first prompt. Obviously, it depends what you're trying to do. But unlike your assistant or intern, this thing's not going to get tired if you do 10 questions almost the same and you just change a couple of words. So try over and over and tweak it and you'll learn exactly how these things work as well. You'll learn what they're good at and what they're not good at. So first section, um, we're going to just touch on descriptions, blog posts, social posts. So this is for written content. So for most of what I think most people should be doing if you're just starting out in this stuff, is stick to the main LLMs. Do most of your work in the LLM. So the LLM is a large language model. That's ChatGPT. Or it's Gemini, or it's Anthropic, or it's another similar model to that. Those are the pure models. And you can go right into their chatbot, just like you everyone saw when ChatGPT first launched, and you're talking with the model itself. That's where you're going to get the pure results without all the tools around it. And if you want a bit more structure beyond that for just copy, there's companies like Copy AI, Jasper, Notion is a productivity management tool, productivity tool. Um, what what they do, they, they got the same model behind them. They might use different models, but they've got similar model behind them. Most of them use it, are using chat, uh, chat GPT, GPT-4, same thing. Um, but what they do is they give you a structure. Notion is all about productivity and about sections, and you, it's going to save your work in a certain structure. So maybe you're trying to do a series of a thousand blog posts on your destination, and half of that problem is saving it and putting them in the right place. So something, something like Copy AI or Jasper, and then reusing part of those responses and part of the blog posts, etc. Those tools are really good for organization, but for the actual results, just pure results, the models themselves. Most people will still tell you. ChatGPT is the best. Some folks are now saying Anthropic, and some people are now saying Gemini, but there's not much between them. You can get away with most of what you need on the free versions, but you will get better results on the paid. And paid, I think, around $20 for each of them. Now, $20 a month per person. Uh, Gemini's got a two months free right now. So we do this at MacBet. This is one of the first things we built with, with GPT. 
uh, we enter a poor description, poor product description, and we use um, GPT-4 for this, and we use Anthropic sometimes for some of these as well. Um, we just give it a really basic product description, can be written in really bad English and poorly structured and can be quite minimal. And then we create a really nicely structured, well-written, full product description. You can't do that in GPT directly because it won't give you the structure, but it's just an example. If you were just trying to write your whole product description in one long text, you can give it some basic minute, some basic information. You can give it just a list of places you go on a bus, six hours, these six places, friendly tour guide, go, and it's going to create all this content. It's garbage in, garbage out for this stuff. Anything you're trying to get it to rewrite, it's only got what it's got to go on. It can make stuff up all day long. Sometimes making stuff up is fine. Often it's not. So you need to be careful. It can't imagine what your tour is. You need to tell it the basics. But once you've got that basics, you can write descriptions all day long, make them more salesy, less salesy, more friendly, focus on conversion, focus about information, anything you want. It'll just keep updating it. Social posts, and just another example of written content. It's really good at this. I, I wrote, um, I'll get into it in a second, but I wrote kind of a business plan and we drilled down and down into actual social posts and asked it to create. So this was a hypothetical food walker tour of Charleston, create my first 10 posts. That's all I gave it. This is There's nothing before that top post and it's going to give me 10 posts up, into, up to and including launch of this tour you can you can read through those those are excellent generative ai is really good at the creative stuff when you're sitting there and you can't think of ideas for instagram posts or something like that you can't think of how to gamify your product you can't think of how to do a cool interesting marketing campaign ask gpt ask it to be creative give it a target market if you want and ask it to come up with cool ideas it'll do this all day long Back to prompts. Remember what I said about the prompts. This is this is important to follow these rules. A couple of things I'm going to break here, but I'm going to explain why. So business planning and marketing. This is, I think, the best, the thing that's best at that people don't do enough. So my first experience using ChatGPT was with a business plan. Funnily enough, I spent most of my career, for those that don't know me, running the hop on up off buses in San Francisco. Now, when it comes to running the hop on hop off, hop on hop off buses in San Francisco, I th th I think there's only one other person in the world who knows as much as me. Not to brag about it, but it's quite a niche thing, and I spent a lot of my life doing that. So I think I know all the ins and outs, how to run the operation, how to do the sales, the marketing, buses. I know all this stuff. I know nothing about bus engines, but that's fine. So first day, ChatGPT, November 2022. I created a business plan in ChatGPT. And I started that with these four prompts. And this is a really good way to do it. And the results I got from this blew me away. I created a, a few dozen pages in about 10 minutes. I didn't even read all of it, but it was better than I could have done if I'd have sat down and done it over three months. It was really good, front to back. Um, so one of the best uses of ChatGPT is this planning and thinking and strategizing and, and tactics for your business. So I like to start broad. And a business plan is maybe not something most people aren't doing. Think of it as a marketing plan or just think of it as an annual plan or think of it as a objectives for the year. Any of those types of things, it's the same. So I like to start off very broad because we're all biased. We all bring our biases to the to each day. And you might say, listen, I'm trying to create a, a hop on up off tour in San Francisco and I'm trying to target English people and Australians and I want to target young families and people 50 to 60 years old you might come with all this stuff because you think that's what you're doing but actually you didn't know enough to come with all of that plan targeting the English was a good idea you forgot about the Germans and what about the French maybe they love up on a puff so let it let it come up with the information you can always choose to ignore or you can always drill down later but start very broad and let it come out, out let it come up with ideas because we've all got our blinkers on and it's, it's going to point out things that we haven't seen this thing's read everything it knows everything it knows every industry it knows everything pretty much in the world 
it knows stuff that we don't. So allow it to give you that broad information and different perspective. So anyway, back to my prompt. So start with this general prompt, create a 10-part business plan. It's great. It's going to say, number one, financial, number two, operations, three, marketing, four, sales, five, uh, operations, whatever I haven't said yet. It's going to come up with all the sections of a business plan that you would expect. Then I take one of those and pick whatever, whichever one you want. I took the marketing plan. So, okay, now create me an eight. I don't know why I said eight. I should have just done 10 each time. Now create me a marketing plan. So you're taking one of the sections. Now you're creating an outline of a marketing plan. And it's going to say, okay, you need a, you need a web marketing. You need your SEO, your SEM. You need resellers. You need affiliates, all this stuff, socials, everything. Great. Now I've got the outline of the marketing plan. Now I take one of those, which I took social marketing. And I would normally just drill down and say, create me a 10 part or create me um, an outline for what I should do on Instagram or TikTok or whatever, or more broad than that. Give me the five platforms or tell me the platforms which I should be targeting. Keep drilling down, drilling down, drilling down. And when you get to the end, that's the example I just showed you, write the content for my first 10 posts on Instagram. So you followed all these paths and now you've got your actual posts, actual content for your first 10 blogs first 10 Instagram posts, maybe a script for the first 10 videos, anything you want. You've got all this content and it's all been thought through. So this is just a couple of pages. Note on the left is the outline of, on that first prompt. And on the right, a bit similar to the previous example, content ideas for the first 10 Instagram posts. Now, if you were launching a bus tour in San Francisco, if you read that number one teaser post 10 days prior or 10 posts prior, whatever it is, it's a silhouette of a bus against the San Francisco skyline at sunset. I don't think a human could have come up with anything better than that. That's really good. Next one is the brand introduction. Um, it's come up with this name. I don't know why. I think I probably did a typo. Next one is a sneak peek behind the scenes. I mean, this is all really good content. And I use that same thing now. I created the posts. Now take that first post and I went to an image creator and I said, create an image for that post. This isn't perfect. It's actually pretty good. It needs some people on the bus, um, but it's a pretty good start. And that's another example of that. Also, this one needs people. This is how you tweak things. I'll go into images in a bit in a bit. But you start off with something, you notice what's what's wrong, what needs to be tweaked, and then you hone in on exactly what you're trying to get out of this thing. Another one I did here, this one I broke the rules of be concise, but I'm just messing around, just trying stuff. Um, I'm sure this will be an illegal tour because I obviously have no rights for Harry Potter, but design a tour in London for around Harry Potter, gamify it, make challenges along the way, puzzles. Weird thing, I, the second last one there, create five ways to price this tour. I'll go through that in a second. And then the customer will be a visitor from London. Again, broke the rules there. I should have left that open. But this is the exact prompt I typed in. And this is just a section of what it came back with. Now, I know London pretty well. I haven't gone into all of these to make sure they're all legitimate. But I think they are. King's Cross Station, Platform 9 and 3 quarters. One of the worst tourist traps you'll ever find. It's just a fake sign on the wall of a station. But anyway, you can wait in line there for two hours to get a photo. All these other things but regardless this is what it comes up with in four seconds i would then take this i would check them all i would ask it to to broaden each one and come up with more information for each one but it's come up with the challenges and the puzzles on the next section down below this was really good um, and everyone should look at things like this for creating products the pricing thing, bit of a weird one. I typed it in there. Again, I broke all the rules by typing such a long prompt in, but it did just fine. It's got a section after that, by the way, by the way for the American visitor, which I decided was a good idea. Um, but the pricing strategies, if you look at those five pricing strategies, this thing's never been to a travel conference. It's never read a travel publication. It's just broad training on all the world's internet. And if you've been to 50 travel conferences, you can't, you couldn't come up with better pricing strategies than those five. I'm not saying that's all, but those are pretty good grouping. If we all sat in a marketing meeting, decided let's come up with the five kind of outlines of pricing, that's what you might come up with. Last one, I'll just go through trip itinerary. I do these all the time, demos of the various models. 
you can create, maybe you're doing groups or something, you can create a really personalized itinerary for a group that's coming in. So I created this four day Orlando kids, love animals, hate Disney, like outdoors, no Mexican food, whatever. And it comes up with this. You don't need to read it all, but it's very capable of coming up with an exact itinerary for all of those very personalized requests. It'll do a really good job of this. Third section, communications and chatbots. This is the one you might hear about the most. Um, maybe not the most, but a lot. Chatbots, as everyone knows, haven't, re haven't really worked up to now. Everyone hates them. But now it's different. And uh, now you can power your chatbot with AI. So now customers, instead, the problem with previous chatbots is that it's all pre-programmed, right? So if the customer asks this, then say this. If they then ask for this, then say this. So it's all planned and you get quite a boring response and you can get caught in these loops and it can't get out of it. Now they're almost too broad, but now you can ask normal language. So I can just go in and ask anything I like of a website or a company and it can use its normal language, its generative AI skills to respond to that. So as a company, you need to get all your information into a place so that your customers, if it's a, if it's a B2C chatbot, so your customers can query that information. The trickiest part about that, and it is tricky, is you're, asked, you're trying to query some information and use that exactly, which is often very important because it's got your cancellation terms and your and your pricing and obviously some critical information in there that you can't mess up. But you're also trying to use the power of the LLM to go off and use its knowledge. So it's quite difficult. It doesn't know when to use its knowledge versus your knowledge. And that's something which you can't really build quickly. So the reason I put a couple of companies on here, Thomas and Satisfy Labs, is this is what they do for a living. So they'll get the, they'll spend a long time and get this right so that it doesn't make mistakes. Because this is where obviously you've got customers free chatting with your company without a human potentially there. And it's important to get this right. But this is something everyone is going to end up having. It's probably been the biggest impact of generative AI so far is replacing customer service jobs because most of these questions, 90 something percent of these questions can be answered excellently with an AI chatbot. And ideally the 10% or whatever the number is that can't, it can just pass on to a human who can then tell you the answer. So you've gone from 100% to just 10% of those humans taking over. Um, another couple of things on here, the review response I touched on earlier. So you could type in examples of previous reviews. Everyone knows they should be responding to every review, whether it's good or bad. And now you can generate responses. With all of these things, it's important to always check your work. These things are not consistent. They're much better than they were, but they're never, maybe never, they're, they're not 100% accurate every time they sometimes do wobbly answers so you need to always check before you especially when you're doing something like post back where respond to reviews interestingly the hardest ones to respond to are the good ones because most people just respond and say hey thanks for visiting i appreciate it please come back soon and you copy and paste it or you do a variation of that and everyone looks at it and thinks yeah you just copied and pasted that in doesn't look very very um like you spent a lot of time on it. So now you can spend even less time on it and come back with a different response each time. Same thing with email communications. This one's a bit hairy because I'm not sure about responding to emails, maybe those sales emails, but responding to emails with AI content is a little bit, um, it's probably not going to happen in a way as pure as that. But to use it to formulate a response to an email, then go in and personalize it and make sure it's correct is excellent. Or have it check emails. I speak to a lot of people that speak maybe English as a second language and they use this, use this stuff all the time just for checking their, their language. Multimodal, this is the non-tech stuff. So just the same way these language models or in a similar way these language models have been trained on text, they can also get trained on other formats. So you can use a text to create an image you can input an image and ask it to describe that image. You can input text and generate audio. That's been around quite a while, but today the voices you cannot tell are not human, whether that's good or bad. You can input audio, transcribe to text. That's been around forever. <clears throat> We've all seen those on, on, on YouTube. That's auto transcribed or on your Zoom call. 
you get the little bot that shows up and gives you a transcript afterwards. Everyone should be doing that. Um, and then text a video, which is not really happening yet, but there was a big, not a launch, there was a big demo of Sora, which is OpenAI, which is ChatGPT, creating one minute long videos about a month ago. That's not available to us yet. And then the stage after that will be video to text. So input a video, describe the video. So these things are all out there and happening. Some are better quality than others. So this is one that is not there yet. This is Adobe. And this is just image generation from scratch on the left. Bit of a disaster. This is how most of the models were about a year ago. Um, I haven't actually checked Adobe in a while. Maybe it's better now. But Adobe, I think, are going to be a player in this, not for generating images up front, but for fixing them. So I can now, instead of um, changing the sky, maybe it started off gray and I want to add some blue sky in that, I'll, I can just go in and say, change the sky to blue. Now, most of these things you could argue, well, I could already do that in Adobe Photoshop. And you could, but not, not everyone can use Photoshop. And you can also do it much quicker. Generally, to do the sky, you're going to trace around it. You're going to draw an approximate line and find the right color. And, it's, it's a little bit messy. So Adobe is going to probably own this space where you can edit your images within Adobe using AI, just talking to it and explain what you want. These are generated images. This was a while ago now. They're actually better than this now. You could probably tell two of these are real, two are not. Um, you could probably tell the ones that are not real. It's the, it's, the worst, it's the worst ones, top left and bottom right. They probably look too, well, they probably don't look quite realistic enough. But you can generate images that look real today. Um, same thing. If you're going to stare at it, you can find some faults with this one on the left. Everyone's got kind of maybe the same smile. I'm sure there's some other things. There's usually too many fingers on some people. But actually, both of these are both of these are fake. They're pretty good images, you, which you could use today. This is me creating a market in Asia somewhere. On the right is a boat in um, Halong Bay in, in Vietnam. So this is an example of iteration. So I did that first. The sky's gray. I don't want the gray sky. Let me make some blue sky with some white clouds, which usually works better. Let me add a flag. And then let me add some sharks and pterodactyls flying around. No problem. Each time, iterate. It just creates whatever you want. These I used um, Bing and Microsoft Bing, or which is now called Copilot. Microsoft uses um, ChatGPT, so Microsoft ChatGPT kind of in a, in, a, in a partnership over this stuff. So most of the tools that you see in Microsoft are going to be from OpenAI slash ChatGPT. Often gets this wrong first time. This is me trying to get some folks doing the usual selfie on the bus. That's what it thought was a good idea on the left. The one on the right is a better photo than I've seen any company use in London. Um, it's not perfect, though. What, some of the things it's not good at are letters. You can see on the side of the bus and on the front, the letters are off. I think there's no driver. Uh, but if you're not staring at this stuff, that's better than most people have for photos on their website today. Mid-journey I'm going to talk about. So uh, Google does images now. Google um, Gemini does images. Like I say, ChatGPT with the pay plan, you can create images, or you can do that in Microsoft Copilot for free. There's some free plans. There's some other pay plans. Mid journey is the other one that people talk about. Mid journey is really good at images. It's a bit tricky. It's it's run on a, on this Discord server. So gamers all know about Discord. It's like a Slack channel. So you actually go in, you create an account. It's a paid account. And you're actually writing your prompts within the Discord. And it's a bit weird because other people are also in there writing prompts and creating images. It's weird, but it's also really good because you're actually in there with other people. You can watch their prompts. And some people are writing paragraphs for prompts. They've done this a long time. They're really good. They're creating some amazing stuff. So it's a really good place to learn how to do the prompts because it gets quite tricky with images. And it's a really good place to look at others for inspiration on the type of things which you could do. There's a lot of fails still on images. Anything with letters usually is still difficult. Logos are not good. Here's some examples of logos. These are getting better. If I spent some time, I could create decent ones. Good example of iteration. But this is just my first shot, right? I create a simple logo. If I, I could then take one of those and iterate on it, and I could come up with something good if I wanted to. 
but it might take a little little while. They're really good at coming up with quick, simple logos. Um, so if you've gone off talking to experts for just quick, simple things. So Section 5 agents and other tools. So some of these you've seen, like meeting summaries. I always tell everyone to use Otter. Otter is um, is an app that will you can bring to your Zoom calls or whatever kind of video calls. You can also just have it on your phone. So say you're going to a trade show and you're doing meetings with permission from the other person, you can sit there and record all of your meetings. Maybe you're doing 30 meetings in a day, 15 minutes each, and you're struggling to take notes because who could take notes throughout the whole meeting? It's also rude to be writing the whole time. So you just sit there with your otter, tell the other person, do you mind if I record it? I'll send you the send you the summary. And this thing will record each meeting. It'll email you afterwards and say, here's the transcript of the meeting. It'll give you a summary. You can then use that and say, what are my what are my um, what are my tasks I need to take out of that? And send it to the other person. So they've also got the same notes from the meeting. They could take the same exact transcript and find their objectives or tasks out of the same. So use that for meetings, use it for, for Zoom calls, because you've got the auto summary, whether you use it or not, it's there for you. Things like training docs, I think everyone's going to use these for operational training docs, operational the same. One of the training things is um, you can use video now. So HeyGen is a really good tool, which gives you a video um, avatar, and you can give the script, you can obviously write the script in, AI, if you like, and you can give it the script and you create an avatar and the avatar reads the uh, the script. You could create the avatar in your voice, if you like. You could even create the avatar to your person, if you like. So it's you or, or your person. You'll need that actual person to do the voice. Uh, they won't just take a third party voice without the person being there. So it doesn't get stolen. But if you've got a person and uh, in your company, you want them to do the voiceovers, you record them for, say, a minute. It learns the voice. You can then upload unlimited amount of content for them to be a video person, a video avatar reading content. You can also have them do multi-language. So maybe you're doing a one-minute summary describing your hotel or your tour. You can now translate that to 50 languages and have that person speak 50 languages. Perplexity similar, you said it's more of a sort of search tool. And then character AI, there's lots of these now. These are agents, um, different types of agents. I'll go into a little bit. And I won't cover this in depth because I'll go on too long. But an agent is, a, is, first of all, they can be friends online. There's, there's AI agents now that can just become your companion. Those are selling really well, funnily enough. Um, that's one kind of agent. Another kind of agent is going to be an agent that does something that actually takes on tasks. These are just being really trialed now. Um, OpenAI is kind of starting with some basics of an agent, so you can give it some basic objectives. But we are going to end up in this place where you, where each person has an agent and going to use software for this, and you're going to feed in your objectives into this agent. And then everything you do that you want it to do you can bring in your agent to respond to an email. You can bring in your agent to send out emails, to summarize calls. So instead of just having a general summary from Otter of a call you just had for an hour, you can now have your agent read that summary and actually turn it into things which are useful to you because your agent knows what your work objectives are. So it's going to read that, take your work objectives, say, what are the five things I need to do after this meeting based on my work objectives. So these things are coming. Um, it, the, they're all in a bit of a sort of trial state right now, which is why I haven't really put any names on them. GPTs are a type of agent. This is part of OpenAI, if you have the, the paid service. So now you can create a GPT. So when you're creating a GPT, you're creating access to data or access to a tool. So say I've got a load of content for San Francisco. I've written a load of blog posts for San Francisco and tour guide scripts, and I know all the information about San Francisco. I've got a list of restaurants I recommend. I can, I can now easily, within a few minutes, create a GPT, 
and then I can give that GPT to other people. Now they can query, they can use my GPT. So my GPT is a San Francisco tour guide. And I've made one of these. It, it does take a few. If you have the content there, it does take about 10 minutes. Now I can give that link to anybody and anybody can chat with my GPT. So anyone can say, what are the best restaurants in San Francisco? And my GPT will respond with what well, I recommend these five in North Beach. Those are those five because that's the data that I put into my GPT. So this is like an agent. I've created now an agent which you can speak to. You can all create agents and give them to other people. You could use these internally or you could you could send these to um, to customers if you like. But I think everybody should have a GPT because they're free. And if nothing else, train it on your daily work objectives. And then you query your own GPT if you're in a bit of a non-inspirational spot and you can't think of what you want to do today you can query your own gpt you can say listen i'm trying to resume resurrect my uh, instagram account here what are some good things to do and it will take it and it, it'll listen to your question it'll say well start with this do this post think about this strategy because it knows what you're trying to achieve so that's something everyone should play with and go and have some fun with and learn how to use Plex, I just mentioned, uh, these, this is a Chrome extension. You add it to your Chrome. Now when you're on a website, you can ask it a question about this website. So you can ask, what does this software do? And it'll summarize the website or the web page, depending on what you want. This is what's happening now as far as productivity, is these AI tools are being incorporated into all software. So the big two are Microsoft and, and Google. Microsoft uh, Office or 365, whatever it's called today, now incorporates Copilot. So now you've got AI tools within Word, AI tools in Excel, PowerPoint, etc. Some of these are great. Some of these are still need need to be worked on. I think the tools in Word are excellent because it's text to text. PowerPoint, not quite so much. But you can now ask questions within the software. Same thing for Google uh, with Gemini. Now, Gemini is incorporated with Docs, with Maps, with Google Travel. So it's all become kind of one platform. So you can give it instructions and jump between applications. These are quite early still, but this is where we're going to end up, where our AI is sitting in the background, always on. And I think we'll get to a place, just like with autocomplete on your phone or on, or on your Gmail, you don't really think about it anymore. You just use it. I think we'll be at that place soon where you're not really thinking, oh, this is an AI tool and this isn't. It's just magic and it just happens and it just works and it does cool things in the background. It's not really any different to some old AI stuff, pre-gen AI, where some things just were kind of magic and you didn't really know why they worked, but they just did. That's the next stage of AI, when stuff just works and we forget that it's AI or not. Summarizing, just some general tips then. Experiment, you don't need to pay a penny to play with most of these tools. So ChatGPT's got a free version, Gemini's got a free version, Anthropic does. You can go all day, you've got access to the world's information to the most powerful computer ever built, and you can do it for free. So go and have fun with it. Think outside of the box. Try not to come with your bias and try and think of something a bit more, a bit, a bit broader, and then just hone it in later if you didn't get what you wanted to. Speak to it like it's a worker, like it's your assistant. So when you think of an idea of something you'd like to create or a piece of content you'd like to make, just write it out the same way you describe it to another person. Take a course if you like. Some people like courses. Some people don't. I like to watch this stuff on YouTube. There are a million YouTube channels. You can watch all of this stuff. Um, and experiment. Try it. Just, just type it in. Nobody's sitting there judging it. ChatGPT doesn't care what you type in, and if you ask a stupid question, nobody's recording what you've what you've um, what you've what you've typed in. Data, as far as data, big companies, obviously you've got policies. You need to think about your data. For small companies, OpenAI doesn't care about your data. They don't care about your prompts. They don't care about your super cool Instagram campaign. They're not saving that to sell it to your competitors. It's it's inconsequential for them. I wouldn't go uploading your financial results for the past 10 years. Well, I'd say that actually, I, I'd do that in a heartbeat. I wouldn't even think twice about it. They don't care about that. If you're Microsoft, I think probably you wouldn't want to do that. But 
for most small companies, I wouldn't worry about your data. There's also a setting on chat GPT where you can say, don't use my data. They don't want to use your data for training. It doesn't help them to have a bunch of junk that you're typing in. They don't need that data for future training. So I wouldn't worry too much about your data, but I'm not a lawyer. Obviously you got to check that for yourself. So what's next? I'm not going to go into this too much. The biggest thing to look out for, well, let me, let me, let me touch on one. Um, the Google and SEO, this question always comes up when I do these presentations is Google said from very early days on this stuff, it doesn't care who wrote your content. It cares that it's helpful and useful to the consumer. If an AI wrote it, fantastic. If you spent five hours doing the same thing, equally fantastic. As long as it's useful to the customer, Google doesn't care who the author is. Um, and on top of that, there's absolutely no way for anyone to tell what was AI written and what wasn't. Sometimes you see an article and if you know the person, you can tell because you know their style. Sometimes there's certain words which AI likes to use and doesn't. But if you've edited it or if you changed it or if you want to change those words, fine. If I if I posted a, a article, an AI generated article, people people who know me would would know right away just because of just because of styles. We all have different styles. But if you're doing blog posts, Google has no way to know if it was written by AI. And that will always, I think, be the case. Um, hallucinations are the things to look out for. Hallucinations, like I said in part one, are when the, is when the AI makes things up, lies, comes up with stuff that isn't true. That still happens. It's it's much much less common now. But it is the reason that you have to check everything that AI writes before you send it to anybody else, especially to customers. So don't put anything out there without checking it first, which is a shame because you can't fully automate all this stuff. You can't have it generate a whole series of emails and send it to a thousand people and do some marketing. Maybe that's a good thing that you can't do that. You can't do some big marketing campaign and go back and forth because it will start to mess up. And if it goes off on an angle, you can't necessarily steer it back without human intervention. Um, stuff to look out for in the future. This this last six months has been really a ton of stuff to do with images, text to image, image to text. This year, 2024, is probably going to be about video. When OpenAI Sora comes out, if it does come out soon, that's going to sort of revolutionize a lot when it comes to videos because that's pretty incredible tech. That's it for this part. No idea how long I went on that, but thanks for listening. This is part two of two. There is no more for now and appreciate all the feedback anybody has. Thank you.